Uh, good morning. Uh, it is true, sadly, that I can't be here much longer, but I'm around all of today and tomorrow, so please do feel free to ask questions both during the lectures, afterwards, lunch, dinner, whatever. And um, you can also email me later if you didn't remember something now and would like to know about it. So I've been asked to give three lectures uh, to kind of set the uh, frame to provide the background for the further lectures that will follow by various people, by Sujit Rajendran and Wilfred Buchmuller and others who will go into more advanced topics concerning the links between particle physics and cosmology, which are uh, illustrated there in this picture of the Ouroboros, which uh, is a familiar symbol telling us in this context how the largest scales in the universe are supposed to have all resulted from the microphysics at the smallest scales. And uh, I guess you are of mixed backgrounds, but I imagine most of you do have a grounding in particle physics. And it has become a very profound realization in the last, I would say, 30 years that this part of the diagram, the part that we investigate at, in laboratories, in experimental uh, facilities at the Large Hadron Collider and elsewhere, that these actually can tell us something about how the, if, if the whole universe began and evolved to give us the complex uh, sky that we see today and indeed where we occupy sort of the middle ground, logarithmically speaking, between the largest scales and the smallest scales. So obviously this is a very large subject and I'm aware that many of you have not had any previous exposure to cosmology. At the same time, some of you may well be experts. So I'll try and keep the discussion at a very elementary level. That's what Giovanni urged me to do. But I will make the odd comment for those of you who are more expert to give you some food for thought. Okay. So let's go. So the first question one should ask is, what does the universe look like? If you look out at the universe, well, we are on this planet, we look out, we see stars, we see stars assembled in galaxies, we see groups and clusters of galaxies. If we make larger surveys, then we see large-scale structure. For example, this famous stick man that was first spotted in the survey carried out by the Center for Astrophysics uh, way back 30 years ago. And a more modern uh, uh, child of the same kind of survey, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is measuring the redshifts of several million galaxies and tracing out what has been called the cosmic web. This is extending over hundreds and hundreds of megaparsecs. I remind you that the distance to our nearest galaxy, Andromeda, is about three quarters of a megaparsec. So we are really talking about very, very large scales indeed. And our conceit is that we are going to be able to explain all this stuff by appealing to the fundamental laws of physics that hold down on scales down to 10 to the minus 18 centimeter, which is what you have been able to prove so far at the LHC. The question is, given this complex universe, you know, if you are, for example, a biologist or have a friend who does biology, they will tell you, you know, it's a very complicated subject. There's just so much variety. You know, a lot of it is just classification and uh, etymology and so on, and it's very hard to get a fundamental understanding. How can we dare to do that here? Well, to see that, we'll, uh, I'll take you through the usual formulation, but I can tell you already the bottom line in advance. We are going to be dealing with the early universe, which actually is a lot simpler than the late universe. And fortunately for us, the universe is mainly dominated by photons, Okay, there are about a billion photons per particle of matter in the universe. So to a very good approximation, we'll be able to treat it as a radiation gas and an ideal gas. And that really is going to help a lot in formulating a simple model of the universe. So the first point is that although the universe is indeed lumpy, as you have seen, it actually seems to get simpler as you average on larger and larger scales. Okay. It appears to evolve towards a homogeneous distribution with small fluctuations that have grown under gravity to give us all that structure, the cosmic web that we just saw. Now, this is uh, best seen by looking at the variance. So if I plonk a box down of a given size anywhere in the universe 
and then look at the variance of mass fluctuations in it, density fluctuations, that gives me some measure of the lumpiness. And this nice plot, uh, I should have credited, it's from Max Tegmark. It shows how the density contrast uh, or the fluctuations in change from small, small to large scales. Sorry, this battery is dying. Uh, small to large scales. So here we have the scale of tens of millions of light years. So this is, uh, light year is of course something you know, but uh, what we are really going to use is uh, the parsec which is the distance at which an object uh, subtends a second, one second parallax. That's about 3.3 .3 light years. And we are going to be talking about kiloparsecs, megaparsecs, OK? But remember the scale in these terms. So as you see, on small scales, you have a pretty large contrast. These are nonlinear fluctuations. The density contrast is greater than 1. So in other words, delta rho by rho, square root of delta rho by rho square is pretty large. This is where uh, we have the Lyman Alpha Forest, which is gas that we see uh, towards distant quasars through spectroscopy. And coming closer still, here is the scale of galaxies. And then when you come uh, to larger and larger scales, we start seeing bigger and bigger objects. This is a cluster of galaxies whose potential well has been revealed by the fact that it acts as a gravitational lens for a distant quasar. And by simply doing ray tracing, just geometric optics, we can determine what the gravitational potential is. I showed you this picture already, the so-called cosmic wave revealed through the measurement of redshifts of a million galaxies in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. We can measure the abundances of rich clusters of galaxies, and then we go to the largest scales of all, the cosmic microwave background, which through its anisotropies on scales of the sky, on the quadrupole, octopole, etc., is sampling the biggest scales in the universe, the size, if you like, of the universe, the present uh, Hubble radius, which is of order about 10,000 megaparsecs. And you see that the fluctuations are continually decreasing uh, as measured from nonlinear uh, to linear to very, very small values, right? And this blue line, by the way, is not a fit to the data. It's a theoretical model. This is the standard cool dark matter uh, model transfer function. And you see it gives a pretty good description of the data when normalized to the fluctuations of the larger scales. It does match what we see on the smaller scales. Of course, this is not really a technical diagram in the sense that there is a lot of fudging been going on because many of these things, we are interested in the fluctuations in the gravitational potential. But what we actually see are the galaxies or the visible matter, so something called bias centers that tells us to what extent the visible matter follows the true potential well set by the dark matter that you will see dominates the total mass budget. So leaving aside those issues, which only experts are concerned about, on the whole, it appears to be a success story. Yeah? Well, Can you the question? he's asking what is the zero. This is not a scale in time. This is a scale. I'm just telling you what we observe when you look at the sky. I do not yet know if there is time, OK? So we'll come to that. I'm, what I'm inviting you to do is to join me on a journey with perfect telescopes and detectors without knowing anything about cosmology to look at the sky. This is what we observe. Let us then empirically deduce from that what we can and construct a world model. But to answer your questions, the largest scales that are right now entering our horizon are here. These are scales that have entered our horizon in the past, up to 7, 8 billion years ago. So these are actually older objects. This is younger. But that we do not know yet. We'll come to that. Okay. Right. Now, let us start uh, back to when observations first began. I should tell you that this is a very young subject until the 1920s, we didn't even know uh, that we lived in a galaxy, OK? People thought that what we saw out in the sky is everything that there is our universe just consists of the stars and stuff and little gaseous nebulae that we see. We did not actually know that we live on one galaxy like zillions of other galaxies, to be precise, 10 to the 11 other galaxies, right? So 
it was only in the early part of the 19th century that we started actually realizing we live in a big universe and the mathematical tools to describe that had been just invented by Einstein as you know and so cosmology was one of the first applications of general relativity and uh, we still have a lot to learn. We are still using the same mathematics that was used back in the 1930s to construct a model for the universe. Now, the first thing uh, that we observe when you look at the sky is we see a picture. Now, this is a picture from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Each of those dots is a galaxy, and what they do is that they expose a picture of the sky, they take the plate, and then at the position of each image of a galaxy, they drill a hole, put a fiber optic cable through the back, so they can take the light out, put it in a spectrometer, and measure the redshift. Okay? It's a very elaborate and expensive process, which is why so far, we only have a million or two redshifts. But when you do that, you get a plot like this. And the brightness of each object actually is telling you something about how far away it is. Because as Hubble noticed, this is Hubble's law. Not the thing that you think is Hubble's law. This is the real Hubble's law. Hubble worked out that if I just look at a picture like that, it's two-dimensional. I don't know how far these objects are. But if there were objects distributed in a volume in three dimensions, in three spatial dimensions, then you know that the number of objects goes as the cube of the scale, right, r cube, but their flux is falling off as r square. So the number that is brighter than some brightness s will go as s to the minus three halves. And this three over two is just reflecting the dimensions in which the objects uh, are spread out and the dimensions in which the light is spread out. Okay. So astronomers don't actually deal with uh, this S. They deal with its logarithm because they look at a very, very wide range of objects. And they define something called the magnitude, which is the log of S respect to some fiducial value. And for some reason, which I, nobody understands, they multiply it by 2.5 minus. Okay? So that means uh, S becomes M. And because of this minus, the larger the value of M, the fainter the object. Okay? Remember that. So s to the minus 3 halves, if I do this transformation, becomes 10 to the 0.6 of m. So in other words, the number of objects in the sky as a function of the magnitude should go as 10 to the 0.6 m if they are distributed uniformly in a three-dimensional space. And here is the test done on that Sloan Digital Sky Survey. You see, this is the plot 10 to the 0.6 m, and the data fitted pretty well, which shows that these objects, which we know are galaxies from the redshifts, are actually distributed more or less homogeneously uh, in the distance that we have probed so far. This is not going very far. This is going about 800 megaparsecs, right? So you see, even without knowing anything other than the two-dimensional plot, by doing this test, which is a standard test in astronomy, it's sometimes called the V-min, V-max test. But this is really an aspect of what you have, might have also have heard of called Olber's paradox. So Olber's paradox is that if this is the case, then if you add up infinite shells of galaxies, you'll get an infinitely bright night sky. Okay? A paradox which was not Olber's at all, uh, but if you read a nice book by Edward Harrison called The Dark Night Sky or something, it was actually propounded much, much further back uh, by Kepler and then by uh, Deschesieu and so on. And its resolution uh, was actually very important. Its resolution is that these galaxies do not extend forever. There is a boundary to the distribution. And the galaxies are so dilute today that the optical depth, uh, well, the surface of the sky, the fraction of the sky that is covered by galaxies is very, very little. It's only 1% even in the Hubble deep field, the deepest we have looked into the universe, where to where we see the edge of the galaxy distribution, we are just seeing 1% of the sky covered with galaxies. That is why there is no bright night sky. Okay? But that's another topic. You might wonder what that line is. You see, there are data points on that as well. That line is actually stars. Okay? Stars are not distributed in three dimensions. They're distributed in two dimensions. They're distributed in a disk. But their light is still falling off as 1 by r squared. So in that exponent, it will be s to the minus 1 over 1. Okay? 
and therefore stars will have a slope which is different from that of galaxies and you see clearly that you can tell the difference between 10 to the 0.4 m and 10 to the 0.6 m. So, I am showing you this in order to impress on you that astronomers have a variety of pretty smart techniques to try to extract information from a flat sky. Okay? This is very interesting. So, what you have established so far as Hubble did back in 1926 is that there seem to be so called island universes which are uh, distributed homogeneously. This other thing of course is the redshift. So, you all know what the redshift is respect to some line, optic line in the laboratory. When you look in the distant spectra of distant objects, well you don't know they're distant yet. When you look at the spectra of objects, stars, galaxies, fainter galaxies and so on, you see that the lines move gradually to the red. Okay? And if you plot that, uh, assuming that that approximates to a velocity, so, if you interpret this in special relativity, the redshift will look like a regular recession velocity. Okay? And then therefore, if I just multiply uh, the redshift by c and I get the velocity and that velocity is plotted here. So, for example, if I look at a galaxy at a redshift of 0.1, its velocity will be c which is 310 to the 5 kilometers per second times 0.1. So, that's 310 to the 4 and that redshift of 0.1 corresponds to a distance of about 500 megaparsecs. These distances were measured completely independently uh, using in fact uh, uh, the fact that some stars, C field variable stars as they are called, fluctuate in intensity uh, at a rate which is dependent on their absolute brightness. So, they serve as what are called standard candles depending on where you, uh, how faint they are on the sky, you can deduce how far they are because they are like standard you know 100 watt bulbs you know what the wattage is from the rate at which it is fluctuating. So, that is a whole story. I will not have time to go into that, but basically this is a recent Hubble diagram based on type 1 supernovae which are standardizable candles. They are not actually standard candles, but people have found ways to use them as such and using that you can see that the expansion is linear, velocity is proportional to distance and that allows us to read off from this that at a redshift of 0.1, the distance is 500 kilometers, uh, 500 megaparsec. So, let us remember that. So, this is what we have established so far and this was already known back in the 1930s, 40s that there is uh, what you can see on the sky are galaxies, they are island universes, they are going away from us and the velocity is proportional to the distance. Right? This was by the way not Hubble's discovery, this was the discovery of a chap called Vesto Slipher who first measured the distances and redshifts. As an aside, Hubble was actually at Oxford, but he did not study astronomy, he studied law. Okay? And afterwards, he was a bare knuckle prize fighter. So, he was a very interesting guy. Now, if you look at the sky and we are following just what I told you earlier, we have some ideal detector and you are looking at the sky. And we first, the thing that we see is the Milky Way, that is where we are, we are sitting somewhere here, we live in the outer suburbs. And if we go further to redshift of about 0.01, remember keep this in mind, redshift of 0.1 is 500 megaparsecs, redshift of 0.01 is 50 megaparsecs. So, if I go out to 50 megaparsecs, which includes the local cluster of galaxies, then I see this tracery on the sky of many, many galaxies. If I go a bit further, this is to 100 megaparsecs, I am still seeing the tracery, but it is becoming fainter. The contrast is getting less as you saw earlier and so on. I keep tracing it out and every time I do this, now that I have given you the formula, just multiply the redshift by the speed of light. These are all small numbers compared to 1, so it is a very good approximation. Multiply by the speed of light, you get the recession velocity and then you can read off what distance it is. So, redshift of 0.1, I remind you is 500 megaparsec, 0.01 is 50 megaparsecs and so on. So, up to here, you see you have gone to about 250 megaparsecs and you can see that the contrast is actually diminishing, of course, by I and this is color coded, you can't really tell, but if I measure the power spectrum of galaxy clustering, then I can measure it uh, explicitly. And then I go to the farthest point up to which we can do such surveys, which is about redshift of 0 0.06, which corresponds to about 300 megaparsecs, right? Beyond this point, we don't really have much data. So, at this point, I should tell you that I've been talking about ideal detectors, but in real life, of course, you have to get time on a telescope and look for stuff 
and it takes a lot of resources and a lot of energy to do that, so it's not easy. We don't have some magic detector that maps out the entire universe. We have a lot of data up to redshift of 0.1, which is most of astronomy and cosmology, 99% of it. And then we have now some high redshift data for which we have had to use objects like the Hubble Space Telescope and things flying up in space because they are redshifted to the point where the radiation can only be seen in the infrared and far infrared, not from the ground. The atmosphere of the Earth absorbs all that light. Okay. But to cut a long story short, I'm now going to fast forward to redshift of 1000. Okay. Now you might say, what is the redshift of 1000? Clearly that can't work with the formula that you gave me earlier, and I did say that that only works for redshift less than less than one. Redshift of 1000, we'll see later what that is, but let's just try to, I'm just trying to make the point that the same contrast that you saw earlier becomes much, much smaller, and what we see at a redshift of 1000 is just a smooth sky of radiation, okay, with my ideal detector, which can see in microwaves as well as in optical light, and in that radiation, there are just tiny patches of fluctuations, which are something like one part in 10 to the 5, okay? So we see that if we go back, so when you look out in distance, we are looking back in time, we are looking back to the beginning of whatever, you know, we are, we are looking back in time, we still don't know where it all came from. What we see is a black body radiation with this precise temperature, okay? This is the most precise to measure quantity in cosmology. It's the temperature of the microwave background spectrum. And it seems to have fluctuations of no more than you can see. It's up to about you know, 30, 40 microkelvin. The temperature is three, mic three kelvin. So it's uh, of order one part in 10 to the five. Okay. So this is the basis for my statement earlier that the early universe is actually going to be a lot simpler than the late universe. The late universe is lumpy, inhomogeneous, Modeling it is a nightmare. We, we do it in the way that I'm going to describe, but there could be lots of issues there that you have not yet sorted out. Whereas by contrast, the late universe is going to be very, very simple. Now, uh, the point is that, when you, as I said, when you look out in distance, this is the Hubble Space Telescope looking out in the so-called Hubble D field, and we see this universe of galaxies, and then as you look further and further back, there are no more galaxies. We see that the sky is, uh, we see all the galaxies we can, but they only cover about 1% of the sky, right? And beyond that, we see nothing until we get to a very high redshift when we start seeing the universe has got sufficiently hot and dense that it has become ionized, and that radiation that we are seeing is the black body is surely evidence of a equilibrium thermal phase from some hot, dense early state. And that's exactly what we are seeing. So this is the picture you must keep in mind. We just look out, we look back in time. If we could look for, far enough back, we would see where it all came from. But we cannot see that because it is obscured from us by this opaque wall of uh, plasma. Because the universe has become hot and ionized. Of course, if we found other probes than light to look back, like neutrinos or gravitational waves, then we would be able to penetrate that but that's not the story, right? Now, this is the, up to here, what I've told you is the standard load. Now, I give you my first uh, slightly more interesting issue for those of you who are actually uh, going to be working in cosmology. I should tell you that there is a big open problem with all this. The open problem is the following. When we look at the microwave background, what we see is not what I showed you in the last slide. What we actually see is this we see that there is a black body radiation in the sky, but that it is hotter towards one part of the sky by about uh, three micro milli k, right? The overall temperature is three k. So this is one part in a thousand. There is a hot spot and in the opposite direction there is a cold spot and the change of temperature from here to there is precisely a cosine function. It is exactly what you expect when you have a uniform isotropic bath of radiation, and I, if you move through it with a certain velocity, if you do the Lorentz transformation, you will see that the temperature then varies with angle as cosine theta, okay? And that's exactly what we see. So we seem to be moving through the microwave background at one part in a thousand, which means V, v over C is 10 to the minus three, and therefore we are moving 
at something like a thousandth of the speed of light, 370 kilometers per second in some particular direction, towards this direction, right? Why are we moving? If the universe was actually uniform, homogeneous and isotropic, then we should not be moving. We should be, in, in our rest frame, the microwave background should look isotropic. It doesn't. It looks like that. Now, of course, you will see later that we can always have peculiar motions. We are all supposed to be expanding, all the galaxies are supposed to be expanding away from each other. But in fact, Andromeda, our nearest neighbor, is falling towards us because the local gravity overcomes the expansion of the universe. So you can have very local small velocities. So if we are moving, then this velocity should not last forever. It should die out very soon. If I average over a bigger box, say 100 megaparsecs, then this velocity should disappear. But in fact, uh, if you look at these papers, you will see that if we use type 1 supernovae, which is what I showed you in the previous slide to trace the Hubble diagram, if we use them to do kind of tomography of the Hubble expansion, if we take shells of galaxies and we find the same dipole in the distribution of supernovae as we find in the microwave background, then we see that this dipole is continuing out to as far as we can make observations, which is this. And these are observations from the so-called nearby supernova factory. Up to 300 megaparsecs, we are still moving. We are still not converged to the frame in which the CMB is isotropic. And in my view, this is a, a paramount issue for the standard model. We have to understand why we are moving. Something is pulling us. And we have to understand what that is which is pulling us. Why is it there? It's a huge lump of matter. Such a lump of matter should not exist in a homogeneous isotropic universe. So this is what the universe actually looks like out to 300 megaparsecs. So we are, of course, in the center. We have mapped out the universe around us. We belong to the Virgo cluster. And then around us, there are superclusters, which are the biggest structures that we can see, clusters of clusters. However, there don't seem to be any clusters of clusters of clusters. Okay? There are no super superclusters. The universe is not fractal. It stops after some point. It is fractal out to about 30, 40 megaparsecs. The dimensionality of the galaxy distribution is actually two, not three. But after that, it is believed there is a transition to homogeneity. But if you look at this sky, which remember Einstein did not see any of this when he constructed his world model. They had no observations those days, right? So you might be a little less confident of writing a simple mathematical model down if you had this data than when the cosmology first started, okay? However, Intuition is a great thing. Those guys had the right intuition, and that model has actually therefore worked much, much better than could be expected. So let us see uh, how this works. But this is the latest current picture of what, our, what the universe looks like from where we are. And the statement that is usually made in the literature is that within 100 megaparsecs, which should be about this distance, right? You see here, that is 100 million light years is 30 megaparsecs. So 30, 30. So this is the scale. On this scale, the universe is supposed to become homogeneous. Well, I leave you to judge for yourself if it does that or not. An important point which really is a, a limiting factor for cosmology and distinguishes it from other sciences is that we are stuck on this particular planet, this particular galaxy. Okay? We are, of course, moving in time, and we see everything that is there along our past light cone. We also see what is along our past world line, you know, fossils and radioactive rocks and all that stuff. But everything that we know about the universe is within this light cone, right? So we have an unique vantage point on the universe. We cannot move somewhere else in the universe and see what it looks like from over there. So in modern language, this is called cosmic variance. You might have differences in how the universe looks like depending on well, if you're sitting at the back of the auditorium or the front or symmetrically in the middle or at one corner, the auditorium looks different to you, right? The overall dipole, quadrupole, whatever fluctuations will look different. So in the same way, the universe can and does really look different. But we think that to a large approximation, the universe is like a Gaussian density field. We'll come to that later. So it doesn't matter too much. However, philosophically speaking, this is the fundamental limitation on cosmology that we can only observe from one point of view. And therefore, we have to assume something 
from a, of a philosophical nature, and that is called the cosmological principle, which was propounded by Mill, who was the civilian chair of geometry at Oxford. He said, well, you know, there's, you know, it's like an extension, if you like, of the Copernican idea, okay? Of course, historians of science will tell you that was a complex idea, not as simple as you might think. But nonetheless, this is what has stuck in the public imagination, that we are not anything special. From being at the center of the universe, we have gone to the point of being nothing special at all, uh, and our position is therefore typical. However, even if our position is typical, what we see from our vantage point may not be the same as what other people see. So we have to make an approximation or rather a, 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 a assumption that things are more or less the same seen from any point of view. So now let's start working on the modeling of this universe because I have to cover quite a lot of material. So this is something that all of you are familiar with. This is the metric which allows you to determine the interval between two space-time events in special relativity, in Minkowski space-time, okay? And you know that that metric is symmetrical. The distance between A and B is the same as between B and A. So there are 10 independent functions in this 4 by 4 matrix. The Minkowski metric in particular, I choose this particular signature of time and space. And that tells me this is the interval. This is invariant for all inertial observers, okay? So Lorentz velocity transformations are actually the same as the inertial coordinates of Newtonian mechanics. Now, the question then arises, how do I extend this metric to cover the situation when gravity comes in and curve space-time as Einstein taught us, right? So this immediately created a problem when Einstein tried to do this because in general relativity, this Gij, the metric, is related to the distribution of matter. In special relativity, the metric is independent of the test particles. That's why they're test particles moving on the manifold. But Gij, if I equate it to the Minkowski metric, eta ij, right, then this is the solution in the absence of matter. If there is no matter, then you go back to the flat space-time of special relativity. However, I, you and I might see nothing wrong with that, but Einstein was very bothered by it because this is contrary to Mach's principle. Ernst Mach, a philosopher, had said that inertial frames are determined relative to the motion of the distant stars in the universe. Something must define what an inertial frame is. And his point was, the famous rotating bucket experiment of Newton, if some of you might know about that, if I take a bucket, fill it with water, hang it by a rope from the ceiling, and then twist the thing up and let it go, what's going to happen? The bucket will start spinning, okay? The water will gradually take a curved shape. And then if I suddenly stop the bucket, the water will keep spinning, still with the curved shape until friction or whatever, you know, stops it and then it becomes flat. So you could ask the question, when the thing is spinning and the water is a curved shape, you look at it and you say, well, it's in a non-inertial frame. That is why it is feeling all these pseudo forces and so on. And the question is, is it feeling it with respect to what? What is defining the inertial frame? Okay. This is actually a non-trivial question. It's something that still exercises people who worry about classical mechanics. But our answer is simply that uh, you know, something is defining the inertial frame that tells the water to get a curved shape. And Mach's principle said that this is the distant stars because in his view, mass or inertial mass was conferred by the distant star. Today, we know that there is a Higgs field pervading the universe. That's what gives us mass or at least some part of the mass, right? Some part of the mass comes from breaking of chiral symmetry in strong interactions. So I leave it to those of you who are budding philosophers to try to work out how that might or might not relate to Marx's principle. Anyway, the point is that this was the historical position that Einstein had, and therefore he had to find some way to define an inertial frame in the absence of matter. So the first option that he took was to say that when away from all matter, the metric becomes singular. Okay? so that Marx's principle is not violated. You never get an inertial frame in the absence of matter. However, De Sitter, who was in Leiden, with whom he was corresponding, said, that's nonsense. If I look at the light from a distant star, it is coming to me through empty space where there is no matter. If you are going to mess around with the metric, then something will happen to the light, and I will not be able to see the star. So this clearly doesn't work. So this is ruled out, right? The other option that Einstein had was to change the manifold, to take that metric 
curves the space in on itself. So this is the classic analog of this balloon. Okay? And if you do that, if you take a two-dimensional spherical surface embedded in three dimensions, then you have a situation where the space is, uh, is finite but unbounded. Right? And it has, because it has no boundaries, it has a non-singular metric everywhere. And this is the model that for curved space-time that has come to be adopted and which we are still using today. Okay? So this thing works. So his world model is basically based on homogeneity, which, by the way, he didn't know about at the time when he propounded this. That was only established later by 1926, as I've already shown you, by Hubble. Right? And what he really relied on was what later came to be called Milne's cosmological principle, that everything is the same for everybody. So you can define some you know, fictitious set of co-moving observers who are all in this space-time, they can all exchange you know, the time with each other, they're all carrying clocks and rulers, right? And they're all comparing notes with each other. So therefore, they'll be able to construct a close, dense coordinate system over this entire manifold, right? And this is the standard model that we are using today to interpret all observations, right? So let me go very quickly through this because uh, I, I mean, this will all be in the notes. Some of you would have done this before. So the name of the game now is to construct an analog of that balloon, which we normally uh, use to picture the universe. But we are going to construct a three-dimensional balloon embedded in a four-dimensional space. The fourth dimension is a fourth spatial dimension, entirely hypothetical. It's just a fiducial dimension. It doesn't exist. Right? So the idea is, however, sketched out here. You know, if you have a balloon, a sphere, then you can consider uh, a, a little, so this is the line element on the sphere, and the set of points that define the sphere are x squared, y squared, z squared plus w squared. This is the fourth dimension, right? But I can also define a, if you like, a ring of latitude. Of course, I can only show you a three and a two, so imagine a four and a three, okay? So the line of latitude here, that little square, will be x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Whereas what I'm showing you here is just x squared plus y squared, and r squared is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So just imagine I put an extra w there. So in that case, if you do the standard uh, maths, so this is the line element. I've got an extra dw squared here, but I can replace it by r squared dr squared by capital R squared minus little r squared, where capital R is the radius of the big sphere, and little r is the radius of the line of latitude. Okay. So essentially, I'm just trying to generalize the line element from three to four dimensions. Okay. So when I do that, then I get a line element that looks like this. Okay. So this is the angular part multiplied by r square, and this will largely play no role in what's going to come because the universe is isotropic, so there's no angular dependence. We are really going to be focusing on this part. And I want you to recognize that this thing which will come later is actually just come from this fiducial fourth dimension. Of course, I can always uh, map uh, to, uh, you know, from one set of coordinates to another. So, for example, I can map into the polar angle chi, and I can write it like this, the polar angle being the angle subtended by a point here with respect to the uh, z-axis, right? So this is already beginning to give us quite interesting physics because basically now we have to ask the little r and capital R. If capital R is very big compared to little r, okay, then of course uh, we see space as more or less flat. We don't see any effect of it. Just like we live on the earth, it looks flat, right? You only start seeing the effects of the curvature when you uh, uh, sample a dimension which is comparable to the scale of the radius of the Earth. In other words, when you fly in a plane or something, you are 30 kilometers above the Earth, then you can begin to see the curvature of the horizon. You don't see it from the ground, right? However, when the two become comparable, then you start seeing interesting effects. So, for example, if I take a standard bar and I move it along, remember that light can only travel along this surface, then you see it becomes a maximum at the equator, and then it starts becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. And when you reach the antipodal point, it has shrunk to a point. Okay? So you get lots of interesting effects, and those are things that people, you know, there's a nice little book by, um, called George, uh, sorry, Tompkins in Wonderland, where you'd find discussion of this by George Gamma, right? 
So, in this picture, remember always that the Big Bang is the antipodal point of the hypersphere that we sit on. Okay, that's one way to think about it, right? Anyway, these are the three possible geometries of maximally symmetric space. That is what we are considering, the maximal symmetry, okay? And if it was flat space, then add angles of a triangle add up to 180. Otherwise, they are more than 180 if it is positively curved or less than 180 if it is curved like a saddle. Right? And now we have to start asking what is the role of time. So far, you have not talked about time. Time is considered to be, just as in Newtonian mechanics, something that is background, okay? because you are going to be dealing with small gravitational fields. So unlike in, say, black holes or something where time is very closely intertwined and, in fact, the direction can flip over, here time is basically considered to be uh, independent of the rest of it. So what we are going to be considering, as was done by Friedman and Lemaitre, is the idea that we are in a dynamic space-time, that space-time that we constructed is allowed to now evolve under gravity. And what we'll then do is to generalize that scale factor, that radius of that big sphere that we talked about into something that is uh, measured by some uh, quantity called the scale factor, A of t, that varies with time. And that is the only variation is time. Everything else is independent of time. Okay. Now, the idea is that if I do that, then the change, any change, dynamical, is self-similar. A triangle will remain identical to itself or become smaller or larger, but it remains the same shape. Okay. It's, in fact, that is because the metric that we constructed is actually conformal to a Minkowski metric, as you'll see later. Okay. If I want to describe an open expanding universe, I can just change this chi to i of chi, and then instead of sines, I'll get sine hyperbolics. Okay. It's trivial. So trivial in the sense, mathematically trivial. We are describing the entire universe, though. Don't forget that. So when I put all this together, I get the so-called Robertson-Walker line element, named after Robertson and Walker, of course. And that is the one that you are familiar with, which has got this part here, which is largely unimportant, because they don't play a role, since when the galaxies evolve, the theta and phi's don't change. The angular part remains invariant. We are only going to be concerned about the radial part, the spatial part, and the only time dependence is here, right? Null geodesics, as usual, have interval equal to zero. So we can trace the path of light rays. We can trace the path of material particles using this metric. The metric is everything that there is. Using the metric, we have covered the universe with graph paper. We can measure things, OK? So you don't then ask questions like, what is the universe expanding into? There's nothing except the metric, OK? The universe is the metric. Visually, this is what it'll look like. These are some nice pictures I picked up from uh, book, uh, uh, yeah, Martin Booker, uh, in a, uh, who shows if you filled an universe with grids, that's what a, a negatively curved universe would look like as opposed to a flat universe, as opposed to a positively curved universe. This is the curvature of spatial sections. Okay? You would still have curvature in space-time, even when space is flat. And therefore, now, we are invited to contemplate the universe as just something which is positively curved, becomes bigger, and then might contract. If it is flat, it remains flat and just keeps expanding asymptotically forever. And similarly, if it is negatively curved, little saddle becomes a bigger saddle, becomes a bigger saddle. So these are all, all of course, cartoons. These are just depictions to try to give us a visual image. Right? Do not follow these too far. Trust the maths, okay? These are just, just to make us feel that we understand what is going on, right? But always the equation is the final arbiter. Otherwise, you get into all kinds of paradoxes and complexities which are, are meaningless. So now we can go back and ask, if it, this is the metric, then why are we seeing redshift? We are seeing redshift because when you look at a null geodesic, d squared equal to zero, that will be just dt over a of t, because they're the only two terms. The rest of it has gone. And then that is just this quantity equals constant, right? So if I look at a particular galaxy, which is emitting light, and I look at the peaks or crests of two you know, waves that has been emitted, and I ask, by the time it reaches me, what has happened to that wave? Basically, the wave has been stretched out, because the scale factor has increased in between the light being emitted and the light being detected, right? So the change in the wavelength of the light, which is what we call the redshift, is simply the change in the scale factor. Okay? And that is uh, the simplest way to understand 
the red shift. The red shift, you can try and interpret it as a Doppler shift for small scales, and you can even interpret the red shift at larger distances as the sum of a lot of local Doppler shifts. But that is not a very good way of thinking about it because that gives rise to the usual paradoxes about, you know, what, can something be going faster than light away from me and so on. The expansion of space has no limit. It's not carrying information. It doesn't have to preserve the central tenet of special relativity that nothing can move faster than light. Nothing is actually moving, okay? In fact, as you'll see, in the expansion is just illusory. It's just a coordinate transformation. Nothing is actually expanding, depending on which coordinate system you're in. But basically, this is the picture. The wavelength of light has been extended, and the change is in the scale factor is just the redshift. Think of it as a different kind of redshift from Doppler shift or the gravitational thing that you would see if you put a gamma ray source here and a detector at the ceiling. That's the gravitational redshift. This is another kind of gravitational redshift, one that operates only on the very largest scales in the universe. Right? So in this picture, therefore, if this guy goes to zero, Z of infinity, that is the Big Bang. And the Big Bang, I try to give you an idea of how to think about it. Think of it as the antipodal point of the hypersphere on which we sit. And that kind of makes sense because when I look out at the universe, I see things getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So how am I ever going to reconcile that with the idea that at one point the whole universe was inside smaller than a nucleus or whatever it is I tell you, right? Because things can get bigger and then smaller thanks to the geometry of curved space-time, okay? Which is not something that we are part of our intuition at all. We live in flat space-time. This is a point that frequently puzzles people. Is everything expanding? Of course, everything is not expanding. Otherwise, you would never know. How are you going to measure it, right? In fact, the precise statement is that bound structures, anything which feels any other interaction, electromagnetism, strong interactions, or whatever, does not expand because those are far, 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 far stronger than gravity. They're bound objects, okay? Even our solar system is a bound object. Our solar system is not expanding. The galaxy is not expanding. It is bound by gravity. It's over density of 100,000 compared to the universe as a whole. It's only when you get to the space between galaxies where the density contrast is much, 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 much smaller than one, where the potential is more or less unperturbed, that you start seeing this overall stretching of the metric that is what I'm talking about. And as I mentioned, there is no restriction on the rate at which that metric can be stretched because it's not carrying any information. There's nothing physical about it. And in fact, as I uh, already hinted, this expansion is illusory because I can always go into a coordinate system where I just take the expansion out. It's expanding at, at a constant rate anyway. I just move to a frame where the expansion is taken out, and then I can see in this so-called co-moving frame, all the galaxies are stationary with respect to each other, right? So nothing is expanding. Now, that is the, basically the essential principles of the standard cosmology, and this is what we are basing our entire uh, framework on. So, okay, so now I come to the dynamics, and then I'll take some questions. So, so far I have constructed a metric I've shown you that you can use that to understand why the light from distant galaxies should be redshifted, how that is a proxy for their distance for small redshifts, and how uh, this allows us to conceive of a, a, a evolution back towards when the scale factor was much, much smaller. When the galaxies are closer together, the universe was denser, and since we know some physics, we know that would mean that it gets also hotter. So I have to start talking about matter. I have to start telling you what is in this universe. So the classic way that the cosmology started was by assuming that the universe is full of ideal matter, matter whose world lines are like this. They don't intersect each other. They just move without colliding with each other. It's a collisionless gas of particles. Okay? It might have pressure if it is radiativistic, but typically it is non-radiativistic. They called it dust. You know, galaxies are like dust particles. They don't hit each other. They just move up in straight lines like that. Okay? So you can think of it as a fluid. The equation of state of that is diagonal. There, are no, there is no vorticity, no angular momentum, no messiness of any kind, okay? no dissipation, nothing. And the only thing that is bringing uh, here from general relativity 
is that Poisson's equations, which you normally would write with 4 pi g rho on the right hand side, now has 3 p added to it. Why 3 p? Because pressure is kinetic energy. The gas in this room has got kinetic energy, it's got pressure. And by, according to general relativity, all energy gravitates, including kinetic energy. So you have to add the pressure to the total budget of stuff that gravitates. This is, of course, the mass energy density for, uh, uh, for, for dust. However, apart from that little change, nothing else has been introduced here from general relativity. So I'm giving you a sort of a naive, simple version of how to derive dynamical cosmology. Birkhoff's theorem still holds on Newton's iron sphere theorem. If I make a little hole, then whatever happens outside it, I don't care about. It all cancels out. Inverse square law. Okay. So the field equations of Einstein, which are in general very, very complicated, I have a metric. From the metric, I can construct this, uh, the Riemann tensor. I can construct the curvature. I can construct the Ricci scalar. So I can write down Einstein's equations in terms of objects that have been constructed from the metric on the left-hand side. And Einstein tells us that the behavior of that, all that, is governed by what is in this right-hand side, which is the energy momentum tensor. And the connecting factor is uh, the Newton's constant. Okay? Now, this is a very, very complicated equation in general. You can see how many indices there are on these tensors. right? And obviously, you need this full machinery if you're going to be dealing when there is strong gravity, say, near a black hole and so on. Fortunately, as I've already explained to you, cosmology is much, much simpler. We have chosen the most symmetric possible space-time that there is, okay? maximally symmetric space-time, the Robertson-Walker metric. You can't get any more symmetries than that. And we have populated it with an ideal gas with a diagonal uh, T mu nu. Okay? We have made life as simple as possible for ourselves. Therefore, we can actually solve this equation. And this equation, basically, only the 0, 0 and the 1, 1 components uh, are relevant. And they give us something that looks like things that we can understand. This is why this model, by the way, is so popular, because everybody understands it. You, all, everyone can do maths with it. You can construct observables based on it. You can go out and look for them. And uh, of course, it leads us to very startling con conclusions, namely that 2 thirds of our universe is supposedly made of dark energy. So at that point, maybe you should go back and look at these equations and ask if you really formulated it properly. But fortunately, that is not the subject of my lecture today. Okay? Uh, so this is the equation, the Friedman equation, as it is called, which tells us that the rate of change of the scale factor is governed by the balance between the energy density of matter, which is gravitating, and the possible curvature of space section. And the acceleration, which is sometimes called Raichaudhuri's equation, has got this 3p from there added to it. And there is a minus sign there. If this quantity is positive, then the universe expansion rate is always slowing down, as is natural, because gravity is attractive force. Okay? But Sometimes, if this guy uh, is, uh, depends on what the sign of this pressure is, you can get a reversal of this sign, and you can get an expansion. So that depends on the equation of state. Right? Now, just to step back a little bit, because general relativity, even at this level, even with this maximally symmetric solution, is pretty complicated. Let's look at the Newtonian example, because that's simpler to understand. So that equation, the Friedman equation that we just saw, just looks like the equation for the acceleration of a test particle, which is at the surface of a sphere of radius r, which contains you know, 4 third pi r cubed times rho amount of matter. And you, each shell, you know how to do the exercise. Each shell is attracting uh, the particle, and you sum them all up. And then you'll get this equation, which tells us, using that second equation, that uh, the acceleration goes uh, with proportional to rho plus 3p times the scale of this sphere. Okay? So I'm just doing this simple Newtonian exercise, which I'm allowed to do because of Birkhoff's theorem, still works in general relativity. And I supplement that with the first law of thermodynamics that tells me that if I've got pressure of the gas that is contained in a volume that is expanding or contracting, the kinetic energy, the particles are bouncing off the wall. They're doing work on it. And so they'll cool down or heat up according to whether I'm expanding or contracting. That's all straightforward. When I take that equation and I solve it, then I find that uh, for an ideal fluid, I should expect this relationship by integrating that once. So therefore, this 
v dot by v is just three times l dot by l because v goes as l cube. And when I plug that in into that top equation, I get that the acceleration is therefore the sum of these two terms and that allows me to integrate it once and I get that the velocity square is going as this, okay. This is an integration constant, sorry, integration constant. So, at this point Einstein who did the same exercise decided because it was the 1920 something, nobody had told him that there were actually island universes and we are this all red shifted and all that. He didn't know any of that. He thought we lived in a static universe and he tried to therefore get a static solution. You can get a static solution by choosing that integration constant uh, correspondingly and you can see that if I choose this guy, this thing equal to 0, then I can get a static universe, L double dot is 0, right. And that will give me a universe of this particular radius which is just 1 8 pi c 0 inverse. In fact, he wrote it down on a blackboard which we have in the Museum of the History of Science in Oxford. It's even got a typo in it, he got the dimensions wrong. But that was the static universe, okay. Actually, this is one example I know, one very rare example where Einstein's intuition went wrong. He should have realized that a static universe is unstable. If I perturb the metric a little bit, you can do this exercise. If you perturb the metric, you'll see that the perturbation grows exponentially in a universe which is maintained static by doing that balancing act, okay. It's not uh, a viable universe. And uh, in fact, when this was pointed out to him, Einstein wanted to do away with that term. But actually, he is not allowed to do that. It's not his choice because once you write down an equation subject to certain symmetries, you have to accept whatever it is that the symmetries allow, you have to write down. So basically, the statement is that the symmetry that underlies this equation, which is general coordinate invariance, allows you to add any term which is multiplying the metric, okay. This is the term that we must allow and this is called the cosmological constant. And this, in fact, is something which is not a matter of choice, but a necessary and inevitable consequence of the symmetry underlying general relativity, okay. You can only do away with it by going to something other than general relativity. In fact, what was recognized later by Zeldovich and Pauli and others was that this lambda term, there is also in field theory, this Tij, we are now talking about an ideal gas, but later we might talk about field theory. Tij has also got the freedom to be scaled by a so-called super renormalizable operator in, in effective field theory terms, which also is proportional, uh, uh, which is like a cosmological constant. And therefore, I can interpret this, I can take it to this side as interpreted as some kind of a fluid which has got uh, uh, pressure, uh, which is the negative of lambda over 8 pi gn, right. But in principle, there is actually a cosmological constant associated with the geometry, another cosmological constant associated with the field theory. And the net cosmological constant is the sum of these two, which are normally completely independent. Right? And yet, we'll see later that interpreted in the simple model that we are using, we are being told that the sum of this guy and this guy, which are two completely different things on some background which doesn't know about this guy at all, is of order the present Hubble parameter square. That's what you are being told. So now let's go to the dynamics of the full Friedman, Remeth, Robertson, Walker metric as uh, uh, universe as we now call it, right. So now we have that A dot by A, we have seen this equation before, but uh, now we have written the curvature in terms of plus minus, we have chosen a particular signature which to reflect whether the space is positively or negatively curved or flat, right. And then we can uh, split it into a part that depends on the background. Uh, which is ordinary matter and radiation and then we can add this lambda term as we are required to do because of the coordinate invariance of general relativity, right. And we also have conservation of energy momentum which is just what we, you know, when we expand the, the volume work will be done on it, right. And that then finally gives us the standard Friedman equation which is what is the basic workhorse of current cosmology. And the plus minus now refers to the open or closed universe. I have specifically put R here to make you realize that that is a reflection of the radius of curvature of that internal space, the fiducial fourth dimension that we constructed in order to embed our three-dimensional space in. So there are two solutions describing an expanding universe. 
uh, which were first discovered, one by Einstein de Sitter, where you put, say that the pressure is negligible, you have dust particles, and lambda is zero and the curvature is zero, in which case you can simply integrate that. A dot by A squared goes as eight pi zero by three, and then A goes as T to the two thirds, because the energy density of matter is being diluted just as A cube as the space becomes bigger. And therefore, uh, the time is just two thirds of inverse of H, and you can relate it to the energy density of the dust which is filling the universe. And then de Sitter found another solution, the opposite extreme, where you have no matter at all, that is zero, but you have a cosmological constant lambda, right? You just have that. So A dot by A square is equal to lambda by three. So therefore, A goes as E to the square root of lambda by three times T. It's an exponentially expanding universe without any matter in it. A direct violation of uh, Marx principle, if you remember that. It's an anti Markian solution. So the joke at that time was that this was motion without matter and that Einstein's static universe was matter without motion. Okay. And of course, you can now construct many things in between, but these are two standard models that uh, have come to, uh, uh, to, to uh, analyze. And of course, in more general terms, you can have both matter and lambda, and you have to ask for the consequences of having a lambda term. If it is comparable to H squared, then it will be of order uh, similar to the matter density. So you can have Lemaitre's universe, which is like expanding and then goes into a coasting phase, a bit like Einstein's static universe, but then lambda picks up again and goes exponential and so on. Okay, so this is all I have to say about the construction of the standard cosmology. We are now going to use this standard cosmology as it was done in the 1930s, okay, nearly 100 years ago, to now start exploring the early universe. And I see that I have another 25 minutes left, so I'll take another 15 minutes to do the radiation, uh, 10 minutes maybe, and then allow time for questions, yeah? Okay. So are there any questions at this stage before I go on, or would you rather wait? Yes? Yes, I have not discussed topology at all. Actually, I had a couple of slides on that which I left out since I'm meant to be talking about the early universe. In general, the universe's topology is an open question. None of what I've said decides the topology, right? However, if once you are stuck in one particular geometry, negative or positive, it is very hard to imagine how you can have a transition to the other geometry because that would be a so-called folding transition, okay? In order to fold, you need one more dimension to fold in. We, uh, 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 well, so you could imagine doing it if you are a particle phenomenologist, you can do anything. You can imagine an extra dimension and fold in that, but uh, not in the classical space time that you are considering. Um, I was wondering, that uh, result, the dissiter's result can also be found uh, just by taking pure vacuum energy, am I right? This one, yes. Yeah, yeah. okay. That's exactly what the Desiderate universe was. Yeah. And the so-called steady state theory was based on that metric. And so we have had space spacetime right from the beginning of cosmology. Right? It was ejected because in order to have that, because the universe is getting diluted to have anything in it, you have to constantly create matter. Uh, at not a very great rate, you have to create one atom per century per galaxy or some, some small number like that, right? Uh, nonetheless, um, it was the steady state theory was ruled out because it will not give you a hot Big Bang, which is what you are going to come to, right? But actually, all the mathematics of the steady state is now still present in the so-called inflationary universe. Things just go round and round, right? And people rediscover them. Uh, you said that the universe is the metric, and uh, I've heard several times that the Big Bang was something like a huge amount of energy concentrated in a point. What is the meaning of that? Uh, well, you better ask the guy who wrote that in the New Scientist or something. It doesn't mean anything. So, uh, the Big Bang is really something which happens in the whole universe, yes, which you, we don't know the size and everything else. Right? No, we don't know anything about it. Big Bang is the... Uh, I'm only concerned with what I can see and construct, as I've done for you. Right? Thank you. Okay. Now, the next question is, 
having done this, and as I said, I'm still stuck back in 1935. I better fast forward to the modern day. So I'm going to construct for you the early universe. You're going to go back 14 billion years to the very first, earliest second and all that. The first question you might ask is, how do I know that the laws of physics that I measure in the laboratory today are the same 14 billion years ago? No. You might say, why not? But OK, that's a, that's a good answer. But it, it could also be that they're different. I mean, you might ask a string theorist, and they'll tell you all couplings of nature are expectation values or moduli fields or something, and they're evolving. So maybe you know things were different in the past. Well, is that true? We can do experiments. Here is an experiment uh, done by optical astronomers, Webb et al. in Australia, who are looking at the fine structure constant. And what you see there is the variation in the fine structure constant, which, of course, as its name says, determines the hyperfine splitting of spectral lines. And what they can measure is that as you look back in redshift, up to a redshift of 4, which is basically most of the age of the universe, the fine structure constant stays within a few parts of 10 to the 5 of its present value. Okay? We well, see one part in 10 to the 4. Actually, at one time, they were claiming they could see a trend. But what I take away from this is that there is no evidence for a change in the fine structure constant over, uh, what do I have here? over 12 billion years. I think that's a pretty interesting result. Right? So I'm going to use that as my justification for extrapolating back physical laws back whenever I like. because you would have expected to see. So if those moduli fields are changing and varying the fine structure constant, they stop doing that in the first second of the universe. Okay? That's a very powerful constraint, by the way, on those ideas. In fact, you'll see that everything should have frozen by 0.1 second. Otherwise, you would have seen it in Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So now we can start constructing a dynamical evolution of the early universe because for matter, we know that the number of particles are conserved in a co-moving volume. So this is the number of particles in a volume. It's not changing. Nothing is being created or destroyed. That is 0. So rho, therefore, is going as 1 by a cube. 1 by a cube is a shorthand for 1 plus z cube. right? And therefore, if I can now simply solve the uh, uh, Hubble equation, and I get that a goes as t to the 2 third, you have already seen that. That is the Einstein dc solution. However, if I have radiation, then the thing that is conserved in a co-moving volume is not the number of particles, but their total energy density. And that involves the energy of the photon itself. Because as the box gets bigger, the energy, uh, the energy of the photon is, of course, redshifted. Right? So now it is a times 4. And therefore, rho is now going as 1 plus z to the 4. And the radiation, therefore, the rate of change will go as t to the half rather than t to the 2 thirds. Right? And because this is climbing faster with redshift than matter, radiation will come to dominate in the early universe at high redshift. Right? At redshifts over about 10,000, radiation is the dominant component. Radiation is also the dominant component even today in the sense that the number of photons in the universe, as already mentioned, is a billion times larger than the number of particles of any kind. So. Uh, that makes life very simple when you come to studying the microwave background, as you'll see later. So what is the time at which these two things become equal? I just said one to the other. So I get a 1 plus z factor uh, by equating the two. And that then this equilibrium, the equality value of the scale factor is just the, uh, about 10 to the 4, as you'll see. Right? But notice that uh, rho goes as 1 by t squared at all times, whether radiation or matter. So this is log rho versus log of a. And so the power law of 1 by a cube is this, 1 by a4 is that, and this is the point of equality. Right? Uh, as I mentioned, astronomers tell us that today we, they see some evidence for a lambda, which has come to dominate at the present epoch. It's about two times more than the matter density. And that, of course, is a, is a, a serious issue, because the early universe was radiation dominated. This is growing less slowly. Therefore, it is natural for the universe to become matter dominated at some point. It doesn't matter how much matter is there. This line can go up and down. But I can draw the line here or here or here. That will determine the equality redshift. But ultimately, the universe will become matter dominated. But for the universe to become dominated by lambda, okay, 
just today is very, very weird because it was clearly completely negligible at early times. I don't have to worry about it. You can see how many orders of magnitude smaller than uh, R it is. But the value of lambda is meant to be the Hubble parameter square. This is the actual value deduced from the data. And uh, this is a very unusual number because H naught is the present rate of expansion. So lambda cannot be a fundamental parameter because how can a theory, fundamental theory, know at what rate the universe is expanding today? But be that as it may, this is something that we fortunately don't need to worry about in these lectures because we are going to be up there. We are going to be in the radiation dominated era. So I'm going to describe to you the construction of the thermal history of the early universe, which is normally shown in pictures such as this that you might have seen, where starting today, where we see this 3 degree K background, we look back through all these galaxies, quasars, etc., and we are looking back to a redshift of 1,000 where the universe becomes opaque because it becomes the radiation, uh, the, the uh, universe becomes a plasma, it becomes ionized, and you can't look through it. And matter domination occurs just a little bit before that, and that is significant because once matter comes to dominate, fluctuations can start growing under gravity, so the large-scale structure of the universe starts forming then. Before that, the universe was totally smooth with you know, small density fluctuations, as we see in the microwave background. We can trace the expansion back, as I'll show you, back to reliably to about a second after the Big Bang when the temperature was high enough for nuclear reactions to happen. Before that, neutrons and protons were a free ideal gas, and at that point, they combined to make nuclei. And that's one of the big successes of the Big Bang, uh, going back to 1935, no, sorry, 1953, when Alpha, Fallin, and Hermann gave a complete and still correct theory of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And because we now know that we have a fundamental theory that goes up to 100 GeV, we can actually construct the history of the universe back to about 10 to the minus 11 seconds. However, this part is only based on our understanding of the theory and on uh, lattice simulations of non perturbative dynamics. We don't have any direct evidence of any relic from the early universe, which is coming from either the quark hadron or the electric phase transition. So we know everything reliably up to there, more or less reliably up to here. Beyond that is total speculation. Okay? Beyond that is particle cosmology. And although it is speculation, it is essential to speculate because none of this part explains anything about the universe as it is today. We are here. Our antiparticles are not here. That's a very big fundamental problem that we have to understand because all the, all the laws of physics that we know are symmetric between particles and antiparticles. Okay? There's a tiny, tiny violation of CP in K on decays, now seen in B meson decays, at some, you know, one part in 10 to the 5, 10 to the 8. Okay? But what we are seeing is the order one asymmetry. It's a very big problem. And there's been a lot of excitement about it, so this will be discussed in later lectures, I, I suppose. We don't have any candidate for the dark matter that seems to be much more than the baryons that you are made of, six times more. When, what is that? That could be a new particle, possibly a new physics beyond the standard model. We don't have any explanation for why there are density fluctuations in the universe. We need those fluctuations to grow under gravity, to give us these galaxies, but just Poisson fluctuations, uh, random fluctuations of a gas, are not sufficiently large to give us what we need. So these are at least three relics of the early universe. We have no idea when they were created, when they come from. So we speculate away about uh, you know, possibility of you know, the genesis of baryons, perhaps through genesis of uh, a neutrino asymmetry first, leptogenesis. The fluctuations might be created by a period of primordial inflation. Uh, the dark matter could be a new candidate, a new particle, new stable particle in some physics beyond the standard model. So that is all speculation. So now let me give you a couple of more interesting issues about the early universe, which in my view are open problems, in case any of you are looking for PhD problems or whatever to do. So the interesting question that is very rarely asked, and I think should be asked more often, is does the universe have any net quantum numbers? Okay? Because some people talk about the universe coming out as a fluctuation from the vacuum. A vacuum has no quantum numbers. What do you actually know? The chemical potential, which is obviously derived from chemistry, that is how it is derived, uh, is, is, is the quantity that uh, uh, characterizes a conserved quantum number. 
and it is additively conserved in all reactions because the number of particles is conserved. So it is zero for photons because you can create, of course, photons in arbitrary numbers, right? And so it's equal and opposite for a particle and its antiparticle if you can annihilate into things which have no chemical potential, right? Remember, it's additively conserved in all reactions. So if you have a finite chemical potential, then that is a particle-antiparticle asymmetry. So in other words, some non-zero value for a conserved quantum number. Now, what are the non-zero uh, charges that you expect? They obviously have to be associated with gauge forces because global symmetries can be violated if on maybe by Planck level effects. Global symmetries we know are not sacrosanct, but gauge symmetries are. So we know uh, electromagnetism is a very good gauge symmetry, remains invariant all the time. So the net electric charge of the universe is conserved. But what is it? Is it positive, negative, zero? We don't know. It's consistent with being zero because right back from 1916 when Bondi and Gold wrote a paper about it and uh, then there was a long gap until 2005 when these guys wrote a paper about it, okay? Uh, if you consider a possible difference between the electron and the positive proton charge, right? which would then give you a net charge for the universe, you can easily work out, as Bondi and Gold did, that the moon's attraction towards us by gravity would be overcome by the electric repulsion if it exceeded something like 10 to the minus 24e. And these people have improved it by another factor of 100 by looking at fluctuations in the microwave background. The baryon acoustic oscillations would be affected if there was electric charge. So we just have an upper bound. We don't actually have a number. The net baryon number is very, very small compared to the number of photons. I've mentioned this several times. It's less than one in a billion. But that's uh, su not surprising in the sense that baryon number is a, is a global uh, quantum number. There's no long-range force connected with baryons. We know that from all the eto experiments. There are no fifth forces. So you could imagine creating baryons out of nothing. And indeed, that is, those, those are the theories of paralysis. And similarly, lepton number, right? There could be, in principle, a large lepton asymmetry in neutrinos, okay? Because B minus L is an exact symmetry of the standard model, but it could be violated by beyond standard model interactions, uh, you know. So, so in principle, you could, you could have a large lepton asymmetry, but because neutrinos are now known to mix pretty strongly with each other, uh, you can't just keep it in one particular species, uh, one particular flavor. It will mix with the others. And a large lepton asymmetry in electron neutrinos is strongly constrained by nucleosynthesis. It will change the neutron to proton chemical uh, abundance. So that's probably very, very small as well, probably of the same order. I have not mentioned uh, the question of a net color charge for the universe, which is very, very interesting. I have not written that down because there is some interesting issue as to whether you can even formulate the question because you know there is something called confinement. Having a net charge would, of course, violate confinement. Confinement, of course, is an empirical question, okay? To what extent we know that confinement is true, but, but I will not go into that here. But I just mentioned it in case some of you want to think about it. The dark matter may have a large chemical potential, not a large, about the same value as the baryons. If it is asymmetric, it's quite possible that the dark matter has an asymmetry uh, it's just like baryons, but it is five, six times heavier. And I think um, uh, Zurek will be lecturing next week. She might talk about that. Okay. So now I have, um, well, now I have almost finished my time. So I think I'll, I'll stop at this point, and I'll continue with this in the next lecture, constructing the thermodynamics of the early universe, constructing the equation of state, constructing how we actually know all these numbers that are, this, this picture that you see here, and other similar pictures, how we actually construct that, I'll wait for the next lecture. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now we have time for questions. There. Oh, microphone. Hello, yeah. So in one of your slides, you uh, displayed that the evolution of A dot over A depends on whether the universe is closed or open. So I was wondering, since A dot by A determines the value of the red shift, so by measurement of red shift, can we say whether our universe is open or closed? Indeed, that's how you do it. And the answer is that it is flat. That's exactly how we actually did it. We looked at the Hubble parameter as a function of redshift, 
and look to see if there is a change in, in the curvature of that. In practice, actually, the determination was done by looking at an angular size rather than at an expansion rate, but it is a similar geometric measurement. Yeah, but uh, uh, I mean, can you say it is absolutely flat, but then you are measuring absolutely zero? I mean, can oh, you measure? You're quite right. You can't ever measure something to be exactly zero, obviously. We think it is uh, close to zero to within one percent. That is the current state of the art. I mean, in the open side or in the closed side? That's my question. That, that we do not know. We can only say it's plus minus one percent. Okay. The theoretical yes. prejudice would be it would be towards the open side, but that's a theoretical prejudice. Okay. Thank you. Um, you have said that we cannot exclude a lambda uh, by pure coordinate invariance. What did you mean by that? It means that the symmetry, so the theory that we wrote down, general relativity has an underlying symmetry. That symmetry allows you, so when you want to write down the equation of motion, that symmetry allows you to write down a term which is proportional to the metric. The multiplier of that term that is called the cosmological constant is completely arbitrary. It can have any value. But it also allows to write down an infinite number of different terms, which we don't include. I mean, you can write any power of, of curvature, right, into Lagrangian. Yeah, so anything that is allowed by the symmetries, you can write down. Right? But then lambda, then, then lambda non equals zero is not more motivated than R squared or R cube, right? No, it is, it is more fundam fundamentally more. Of course, you can write down higher powers of R, you can add to the equation, and people do that now. But lambda is more fundamental in the sense that that reflects the actual, the, the, the basic coordinate invariance. That is what it's directly related to. And that is of more paramount issue. The higher order effects in R are only going to be important when the curvature is strong. Okay? Lambda is going to be important even if you have no curvature at all, as it is now. Yeah. Shout out, shout out. <clears throat> uh, with, with regards to your, the, the first, uh, I think, second slide with the uh, primordial fluctuations, um, you had a theoretical curve that had the cold dark matter line. Yes. The first few points in the small scales, it clearly does not fit. Yes. Now, this is a known problem with lambda CDM or cold dark matter. Um, People have been talking about self-interacting dark matter. Do you know how uh, that improves that fit? No, that is, uh, so let me go back to that slide because that's an interesting question. In fact, one that I'm working on presently, but uh, I'm not in a position to uh, answer it in more detail here. Uh, so you're referring to the fact that this is an old plot. So obviously this is not a fair reflection of the data today. But as I said, uh, I'm inviting you simply to observe that the overall shape is captured by the theory, right? Not in detail, because in any case, a lot of fudging has gone on to make those data points sit on the curve, right? So uh, th what he's referring to is the fact that uh, this is the theory based on collisionless, non-relativistic particles clustering under gravity and having no other interactions. And in detail, on small scales, uh, there are may be mismatches with what is observed. Now, those mismatches may well be due to the fact that uh, our understanding of the formation of small structures based on numerical simulations does not yet include an understanding of baryons, which are, after all, there. It's an important component of the galaxy. And baryons indulge in all kinds of behavior, like you know, they lose angular momentum, they radiate, they, you know, they lump together. The simulations cannot capture all that physics. So there is a belief that if we could include the behavior of baryons properly, then that might well account for some of these discrepancies which are there at present, right? However, an alternative uh, and more exciting to a particle physicist idea is that the dark matter itself is not entirely non-interacting, but has some interactions with itself, or maybe it has some interactions with the relic neutrinos, who knows, right? Maybe, so the only thing we can say is that the dark matter does not interact with photons. That is why it's dark matter. But the other aspects of its interactions are pretty unconstrained. In particular, self-interactions are unconstrained to the level that they could be of a hadronic size. And very recently, this is within the past month, there has been some preliminary suggestion 
that uh, dark matter does interact with itself with the hadronic cross section. Uh, and if that turned out to be true, then obviously uh, we would, it would have a significant impact on the formation of small structures. Right? But much of that is not, you're not going to see from a power spectrum. A power spectrum by definition is just looking at the two point correlation. Right? That would be reflected in more complex issues like, for example, the slope of the uh, density profile of uh, the inner parts of galaxies or uh, dwarf spheroidals and stuff like that. It would be reflected in the shape of the halo, whether it's elliptical or spherical and things like that. Excuse me. Uh, you say the chemical potential is conserved in all interaction. Yes. Okay. But but some process like uh, electron positron annihilation of some process in which a, a large a large amount of uh, entropy produced the uh, yes. chemical potential is not conserved in uh, some process like this. Is that a statement or a question? Uh, I I think. Sure. How can it not be? Look at the right hand side. What is E plus E minus annihilating into? Into photons, for then example. Into photons, I told you, don't have a chemical potential because they are bosons. They have no conserved quantum number. These photons are being created in arbitrary numbers and you're absorbing them in arbitrary numbers. They clearly don't have a chemical potential. For some process that a large number of entropy produce, because you... Uh, Doesn't matter how much you produce, if they do not carry a conserved quantum number, you cannot keep track of them, right? You got to have somewhere to keep track. So if you cannot keep track of a particle's number density, right, then that means it doesn't have a chemical potential. And if I've got some species that can annihilate into it, particles and antiparticles, then that can't have a chemical potential either. So you're right in a sense that if electrons and positrons annihilate into photons, the parts that do annihilate have no chemical potential, but I might have one extra electron or one extra positron for every billion electron-positron pairs. Okay, that is a chemical potential. And that is the guy that we actually have. Our chemical potential today is almost zero. Almost, you know, negligible. It's, you know, normalized to photons, it's 10 to the minus nine. We are a little sprinkling of froth on top of a huge sea of photons. So to a very good approximation, the universe is just a gas of photons, right? Which in fact, dynamically dominated in the early universe as I'll describe. But even today, the number of particles, massive particles, is completely negligible compared to the number of photons. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned this problem with the velocity dipole on the yes. CMB, and I wanted to ask you if this actually is just in the dipole or it spills over to other lower L multiples like quadrupole or, and so on. Well, uh, if you do the Lorentz transformation, you'll find that um, actually you should see an effect not just in the dipole, but also in the subsequent um, multipoles, right? So the dipole is affected as beta. Then there is a beta square, beta cube. We can do the expansion. Actually, the Planck people only realized this last year. They were using only the first order thing, and then now they have corrected it. But uh, the important point is not, sorry, the important point I was trying to make here is that, that effect is seen. Planck actually sees the effect on the quadruple, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? There is no question that what we are seeing is a kinematical effect. Okay? We are moving through the microwave background. There was a possibility earlier people had suggested the universe was tilted or something. Right? I think it is completely clear we are moving. If we are moving, what that means, if I can go to the next picture, what that means is that we are here. Right? And we are moving towards shapely. We are moving in this direction. But what you have done is you have looked at shells of galaxies going up to shapely, right? And you see that we are still moving. Even beyond shapely, we are, there, are, there is some data now from the, something called the nearby supernova factory. And the motion is continuing beyond shapely because Earlier, people had thought that somewhere here, there was something called the great attractor. That's what's pulling us. Okay? If that was so, then when I look beyond it, I should see things falling in from the other side. We don't see that. So the motion is continuing in that direction, and it has already got to about this point here, 300 megaparsecs, which means that there is still some as yet unidentified huge lump of matter 
okay, of something like 10 to the 15, 16 solar masses. Okay? That's about million, you know, uh, 100,000 galaxies. We don't see it. Nobody knows what it is, right? It could be, of course, a lump of dark matter, but then you should not expect such a huge lump on that scale in a homogeneous universe. So uh, I, that's why I'm highlighting this issue that it is a very important problem, I think, to understand why it is that we are moving, okay? Remember, this is, I should have called this eppur si move, okay? Yet it moves, we don't know why. Any other questions? Okay, so it's time for a coffee break. Thank Let's you. send the speaker again.